so 2013 was the first year of the actual festival in Manger. Okay. And then I came on board in 2014 just for six weeks to do their press and PR for them. Okay. And I, I left. That's yeah, I've that you hooked. Ever since. I mean, to me, it's just like, it's amazing. It's an amazing thing that's happened to me. It's a uh -huh. dream that I've had for years. And I mean, it took me years and years and years to get that book published. And then out of the blue, in February 2015, we, we, out of the blue, I didn't know my agent was beavering away. And we got um, a proper offer of publication and it all happened this time. So the book deal came at a time when I really, you really needed, needed it. Yeah. And it was the best thing. That and Open Life Festival mm -hmm. have been the two things that have actually saved me in the last couple of years. It's been incredible. So to me, oh, I don't feel, absolutely. I just feel like something really good has happened to me. Yeah. I don't feel that yeah. I'm yeah. in any way special or I just I just feel lucky. I mean, from I was a little tiny girl, I wanted to write a book. I wanted to have, because one of my earliest memories is going to Bangor Library with my dad. And um, we used to, he used to do it on a Thursday night. And at that stage, so the children's library was like in a wee room in the back. back. Yeah. So I used to go in there and I used to like try and squeeze myself in between the, sh the, the shelves and just kind of hide in there with books and I can remember then thinking one day I want to have a book on a shelf in this library and then going into bookshops and thinking one day I want to have a book in, on a shelf in a bookshop and that was, I mean that just says, like it's been something inside of me for years but I suppose like lots of dreams you kind of lock it away then and real life takes over and mm -hmm. and then you know I started thinking oh, well I mean I could never do that so what's the point in even trying and you just you because you, you lose sometimes well I kind of felt I lost the ambition to write mm -hmm. creatively mm -hmm. and then I was approaching my 40th birthday and I thought I don't want to be approaching my 50th birthday and thinking I never try you know I, mm -hmm. I don't want to be 10 years down the line and thinking having a regret that I didn't actually try to do it. So I joined a creative writing class and that was it. That was the start of it. It still took me a while before I started writing what became the book. Uh -huh. And it, it initially I wrote a, a short story and okay. the book then kind of came from the short story. But um, so it was, yeah, so I mean, I'm 54 now and, you know, yeah, my book was published when I'm 53. It was just... And uh, it's that kind of you know it's never too late to do anything. It's never too Brilliant. late to follow your dreams. So Biddy had always known that she was different from the other girls at school. Her appearance, for a start, was a bit of a giveaway. Throughout her years, her uniform was either far too big or much too small. Regardless of her age, there never seemed to be a time when it was just the right fit. Her socks, which were supposed to be beige, were generally a strange colour of puce and sometimes didn't even match. And her scruffy shoes were often laced with scraps of coloured wool from her grandmother's needlework box, which had sat on the sideboard since the old lady's death. But it was Biddy's hair that really made her look, shall we say, unusual. She was the only girl in her class who didn't have long glossy plaits or swishing pigtails tied at the top with shiny blue bows. Biddy's hair was copper and curly, neither long nor short, and it stuck out in every direction. But Biddy wasn't interested in pigtails or plaits. Looking pretty as a concept, or even an objective, never crossed her mind. And then there was her, her name. Her real name, that is. Not the one she would become known by when she was almost ten years old. All of the other girls in her class had nice, sensible names, like Julia or Jacqueline or Georgina. But Biddy's young mother, Gracie, who had not really been ready to have a child of her own when her daughter was born, named her after a cat who'd adopted her family when Gracie was eight. There had been many Flynn family cats over the years. They came and went with regular ease, but old Biddy was special. She stayed far longer than any of the other cats and had only died the week before Gracie went into labour. I'm not bloody well naming her after your mother, Gracie had screamed hysterically at Biddy's father on his first visit to the hospital to meet his baby daughter when he had tentatively suggested that Margaret might be a much more suitable name. And just be thankful it wasn't a bloody boy. He didn't dare to ask what the boy's name might have been. 
As it turned out, Gracie Weir had swiftly realised that she wasn't ready to be a mother and in actual fact had never intended to become a wife. So when Biddy was just six months old, Gracie ran away to join a travelling fair. The family never heard from her again. So that left Biddy, her middle-aged father and his elderly mother. Mrs Weir Sr. helped to rear the child as best she could while her darling son continued to work as a bookkeeper at Morrison's, the local hardware store. She cursed the day that Gracie, that little harlot, had come to work at the, st at the shop. At 50, her boy Howard was much too old to leave home and Mrs Weir had assumed that she'd succeeded in her life's ambition to keep him all to herself. Shame of the whole affair with Gracie and the child had nearly killed her. But you're more than twice her age, old Mrs Weir had gasped when Howard sat her down in the dark parlour to break the news, thrusting a cup of sweet tea and two Mary biscuits into her hands. It's disgusting, filthy. How could you let this happen, Howard? How could you do this to me?